Hey everyone, Sergeant Argerit here, and a cat decided to join me today, so that should be interesting. But besides that, we are going to be watching Napoleon 1813, so we're past all those 1812 episodes. There's a lot of that in 1812, apparently. And we are looking at the road to Leipzig, or Leipzig, whatever you want to call it, I don't care. And Leipzig, or Leipzig, is in the Confederation of the Rhine. They're in um, Saxony, I believe. And William's army, I guess, is going to be pushed back all the way to Leipzig. That should be really interesting. Let's go ahead and get started. What a career Napoleon has ruined. Having gained so much glory, he could bestow peace on Europe. But he has not done so. The spell is broken. Emperor Alexander of Russia, Vilna. I think that's the capital of Lithuania, actually. But I'm not sure. December 1812. 1812 had been. Like, you can see it on the map where my mouse is. What is it? In a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. What? Now, That's huge. Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. What do you mean, Poland and Germany? There's, like, Prussia and then there's the Confederation of the Rhine. Like, both of them, you could argue, are Germany. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with Napoleon. No. Russia's own armies had been mauled, and Western uh, Russia yeah. devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good. Dang. To free Europe from his clutches. Yeah. Napoleon's gonna take Moscow. Emperor Alexander is going to take Paris, all right? Makes sense. And avenge Moscow's destruction by... Well, I mean, they destroyed Moscow themselves, if you think about it. I mean, even though they did loot a bunch of places. Taking Paris. Oh, yep. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Yeah. Russian sure troops sure. had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Yes. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria which what? assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army, but he left for the Kingdom of Naples, hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. Uh, what? He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command. And now faced odds of four to. He was unused. I've never heard of that before. One. Wait, what? And now faced odds of four to one. Oh goodness! As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat. Why is he in Prussia? To west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses most of which were soon besieged. Why is he in Russia? On the 7th of February, Russian troops... Why are the, why are the French in Prussia too? Why, are, why is everyone just having a party in Prussia? I'm so confused. Entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's oh, Polish wow. client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Okay. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin. Why? They're neutral. While Sweden joined the Allies. Uh -oh. Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johan. What? Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he pursues Swedish interests, which is what he now claimed to do. I 
I'm actually a bit surprised that Sweden didn't try to join Napoleon to try to take back Finland from Russia. Because, like, you know, that's a pretty good moment for them. And plus, all the other allies are pretty much defeated. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain, Bernadotte okay. agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since... Six? That's a big number. ...the revolution, with an army of 30,000 troops. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. Oh, dang. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character. Hopefully by this time, Prussia has regained its military might that it's so famous for. Terrified of Napoleon, but with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial... What? They would not gain that. ...material aid from Britain. I mean, some of it, but not all of that. He agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. Hmm. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany. And mine folk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honor. In what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. Thank goodness. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished oh, flogging. God. What's that mean? Expanded recruitment and introduced exams for officers and overhauled training, tactics and drill. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, These animals have learned something. Animals? I thought Napoleon had respect for them. Remember, like it said earlier, that Napoleon was like so proud of them. You know, he was like, Yeah, I'm Napoleon, and I like, and I respect the Prussians and Frederick the Great. They're strong, and I'm strong too. Wow, that's pretty rude to call them animals. Small consolation. They'd learned most of it from him. Oh, that's funny. Only a short time ago, I was the conqueror of the world. Not really. Commanding the largest and finest army of modern times. That's all gone now. Napoleon to Count Smollett. Too well, there he is. Palace, February 1812. Oh. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris. Okay, so they're counting Prussia as Germany then. Working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. Come on, you're Napoleon. 100... You're like, you know, you're good. You're like the best commander in the world. 37,000 new conscripts joined the army. Laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 Marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard, a home defense force, were transferred to Germany. At least they have some experienced soldiers. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. Oh. They were young and raw. Two-thirds were teenagers. And oh. there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry. A crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. 
Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Oh. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of Mecklenburg Schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Oh, wow. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, oh, inspiring Hamburg. local revolts against French occupied forces. That's far away. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organization meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. That's a lot of police. And the emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. The Why, though? Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia on the 28th of April. Oh. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Oh yeah, that guy. Russian troops were exhausted and far from... Also, apparently, one of y'all said in the comments that General Wittgenstein... Yeah, Wittgenstein. He, he was like this... Baltic... German nobleman or something like that. Oh yeah, that's Wittgenstein. Their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Russia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilize their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 400,000 men. Oh. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davou to Hamburg with 35,000 men to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland and re-establish his dominance over Europe. If the art of war was only at the art of not taking risks, war would be beyond mediocrities. We need a full triumph. Only into his march of June 19. As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight. A potentially devastating yeah. blow Go to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. The Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Zala River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course, but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessier, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself and he was hit by a cannonball. He was hit by a cannonball? Jeez. Killed instantly. Bessier was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. Oh, no. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's Third Corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined. Russian assaults. But on the whole, his young Dang. conscripts fought with courage. Despite hours of savage fighting, 
Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. Oh, yeah, that Crucially, That's Napoleon's good. lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Oh. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. Oh, goodness. They're going for Leipzig. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, oh, deliberately yeah. close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Neither happened. Oh. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south, to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. Oh, God. Wow. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. Oh, look at that. Jeez, the French are not doing so good anymore. At the beginning, they were just like, shoot, 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 bam, bam, bam. And they just conquered everything, like you know, like those battles. And now, now with their new conscripts, they're just doing horribly. Also, I wonder what's happening in Spain right now. I wonder if Napoleon did anything. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day, General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, and his closest surviving friend. Oh, wow. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. What is with cannonballs and Napoleon's, like, generals? Oh my gosh. His slow, painful death deeply upset Napoleon. The Emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Udino was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. Oh. Nice. My eagles are again victorious, but my star is setting. Oh. Pulling to General Clauenkort. The armistice of Plaspitz would last more than two months. Oh. A period nice. of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter Marie-Louise in 1810. Oh. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, oh. now took center stage. Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he traveled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. 
but Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria. The... You wanted all of the Illyrian provinces? Dang. Agree to the repartition of Poland or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. Wow. Or were out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. Expected a few. Whenever the Empire attacks in person, attack and defeat his lieutenants whenever he can. Oh, well, that's probably why they keep killing his freaking generals. General morale to Emperor Alexander of Silesia, June, I mean, July 1813. On the 12th of August 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. Oh, goodness. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of three to two. And 230,000? The new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. Recognizing Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks, and wear down French forces until it was time to close in for the kill. Rude. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including 8 million pounds in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition, 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabers, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit, and flour, and 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Napoleon, meanwhile, oh had turned God. Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened Wow. Strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese arm... Oh, wow, he lost a lot of land in Spain. ...at the Battle of Victoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat, the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for oh. his aggressive leadership. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men, that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching. The city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher and raced back to Dresden sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Counterattack? Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank. Oh my gosh! 
It's like Napoleon's main. His main strategy is just to attack. Like he's never defended in his life. Like, just wow! It almost reminds me of Erwin Rommel in North Africa. Like literally, he would just attack and attack and attack, no matter what odds were against him, and he would end up winning. Like because he was so strategic and the way he was attacking. It took thirteen thousand prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. Well, it's like four to one. But news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Udino had resumed his advance on Berlin with sixty-six thousand men, but in three Very days well. of heavy combat around Grossbiren. He was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Oh, no. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Oh yeah, and Saxony was originally with Prussia at the beginning um, to fight Napoleon. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal MacDonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. What? MacDonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and a hundred guns, for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. Oh, no. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Coombe was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Udino, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denevitz. The Prussians fighting to save Berlin held their own until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favor. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another 22,000 men. Napoleon is screwed. Seriously. Oh my gosh. They just lost. They just... You know, defeat after defeat after defeat after defeat. Like one victory. Oh boy, that is not good for Napoleon at all. His line is collapsing. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced and advanced what, what? wherever he was not. That's funny. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Oh, Many of no. Napoleon's marshals advised him to fall back to the River Rhine. But the Rhine? That's so far away! Oh, goodness. No, there's no way they can do that. They're just, like, leaving their ally to be defeated. And they're losing... The entire confederation of the Rhine. Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. There will inevitably be a great battle at Leipzig. Napoleon to Marshal May, 13th of October, 1813. By October, 1813,
Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Welling... Yeah, they lost even more land. ...was crossing the Bidassoa River into France. Oh, God. The first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. Wow. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides. Why? And would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. What? Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden and was heading for Leipzig. Oh, goodness. Oh, here it is. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. Wow. So the fact that Napoleon lost, like, the war at the end tells me that he probably lost Leipzig. So, yeah. Um, the next episode is going to be about Napoleon, 1813, Battle of the Nations. Okay, that's an interesting title. Wow, okay. Napoleon is completely on the back foot. He lost a lot of allies, and they're all against him now. But yeah. Hello everyone, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. And you know, turn on the notification bell thingy. And if you didn't, then make sure to leave a uh, thumbs down. Oh so yeah, that would be greatly appreciated. And while you're at it, go ahead and watch my other videos. They're probably just as good, and if not better than this one right now. Except for my oldest videos, don't watch those. And, you know, subscribe to these people down here, my fellow sergeants. They're other YouTubers that I either know or I have in high regards. Yeah, even my cat agrees. So, thank you for watching, and have a great day.